This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Back. So we've got a compressor for this unit, a disconnect switch for this unit, and I brought my entire van up here. Got another technician working with me today. He's currently getting water hoses thrown over the side of the building because we were here three weeks ago and this condenser is already pretty dirty. So we're gonna clean that. Um, we gotta get the disconnect switch recover or changed out first because the plan is once we get the disconnect switch changed out, we can energize the unit for most of the work and just be working on the third stage compressor and they still have cooling, but we gotta clean this condenser too. And then while he's down there turning the hose on, I'll have him turn off the power. We'll get that replaced, get it back on. I'm trying to be as efficient as possible. Got the new compressor sitting over there. We had to go back with an LG compressor because this is actually under warranty through the manufacturer. So we got to use their compressor. I would have rather put in a Copeland and be done with it, but got to do what you got to do when it's under warranty, right? All right, so we're changing this guy because potentially it had a loose connection causing an overheat situation. It's charred and I don't want to trust the internals of that guy. Got a new one, they went back to the old manufacturer, ABB. Um, so we'll get this guy in. Now this is just an 80 amp safety switch. This does not have any uh, overcurrent protection. It's just a switch. Even though it says 80 amps on it, that's just the, the current that it can handle. Um, same thing with the big giant uh, square D ones that they had in here. Those were not overcurrent. They were just, they look like circuit breakers, but they're not. They were just safety switches. So we're gonna get this guy swapped out. Um, now this does have some burnt wire right here, but there's extra wire in the unit, so I'll be able to pull it out. You always wanna leave extra, as long as it's not gonna be a potential um, electrical hazard, like it's gonna rub out or anything. I always leave a little service loop, so that way in this situation you have extra wire. Now I already verified that we don't have any power, but I'm gonna double check just one more time. But we are safely shut off and locked out downstairs. Nothing, 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 and we'll go to ground real quick. Nothing. I'm checking to the wire because I already loosened the terminals. Nothing, no voltage. So we're good to go. Good to unhook. Now this is a DIN rail mount. It has a little clip you pull off on the bottom. Same thing on this one. Okay. So this guy, like I said, we have extra wire, so we're gonna pull the extra down, cut back the burnt spot. I'd say about right here should be good. Yeah, it's nice and soft right there. That's about right, that's the bad spot right there, so. Make sure you don't nick the wires. Yeah, it looks good. That's why I don't go all the way through the insulation. I kind of break it off by hand for the remainder. Smashing the wire down, but I'm not going to torque down on it because I'll use a torque driver for it. If there's even a torque spec on here, I'll have to see. All right, so um, it says to set the torque driver at 18. So I'm using the Weeha torque driver. See how low it goes. There we go, 18 right there. Let's go ahead and torque this guy down. Now it's a ratcheting, it tells you when it's tight. There we go. There we go, there we go, yep. All right, we're all torqued down, we're good to go. Nice and tight, we'll put the cover on and turn power back on. All right, let's go ahead and turn power back on. Chest power, 207, 206, 203, we're good to go, come on back up. All right, there is gonna come a time when we have to shut this entire unit down when I go to change the liquid line filter dryer in here. For the meantime though, I still have work to do. I gotta recover the charge, start getting sanded and everything. So I put the unit into test mode and 
just basically I'm gonna freeze them out of the building right now. I'm gonna just run it as much as possible on full cooling so that way once we uh, we um, are ready to shut it down, you know, for the half hour, 45 minutes that we have to have it shut down, it'll be minimal. Try to keep them as comfortable as possible, basically. One thing that I noticed though, look at this. When you're in a test mode, full call for cool, it doesn't uh, ramp up to full speed on the VFT. We're running at 37 Hertz. So that's a flaw in the unit. Keep that in mind. I'm pretty sure that this VFD was installed after the fact and it's probably not programmed right. Um, some of these units, because in California we have something called Title 24, which is an extra government regulation that everything has to be like this energy efficiency stuff. So these units a lot of times are pre-made and they don't necessarily all come with the two-speed blower operation like we require in California. For anything over, I think it's, uh, is it anything over five tons, I think? I think it is. You have to have a two-speed blower operation. So on first stage, it runs at a lower speed. Second stage, it runs at a higher speed because theoretically you need more airflow for two stages than you do for one stage. Um, I think it's five tons. But anyways, so we have this two-speed blower VFD right here. So it actually, all it does is when you get a call for second stage, it ramps up to full speed. And then on first stage, it only ramps down to, you know, half speed or whatever. I'm curious though, if I go back, let's go back and let's change it to three stages of cooling. Let's see if it ramps up. Yeah, see on three stage, it ramps up to full speed. Interesting. On two stage, and I know stage is confusing to people, we only have two stages according to the thermostat, first and second stage. But up at the unit, it has logic built inside of it. You've got first stage, second stage, third stage. Uh, so the thermostat only gives you inputs for two stages. But that's an interesting thing is that if you call for compressor three, it goes to full speed. But if you call for compressor two and compressor one, it only goes to low speed. Hmm. Keep that in mind when you're troubleshooting. Another thing, when these units have VFDs, do not ever push in the blower contactors. Now this one, the wiring's been disconnected, but if you push in the blower contactor and it's still wired in, you'll blow up the VFD. Um, okay, so we're gonna get the recovery machine out. We'll get this one turned off and then we'll uh, get recovering on that third stage. All right, we are getting ready to recover. I used the HVAC school app and calculated the total fill weight based on the ambient temperatures and the density of the refrigerant and the, the size of that tank and our max weight on that tank will be 61 pounds, 61.67 pounds. That's tank weight and refrigerant, okay? And we're currently at 40 pounds right now, 41. So we got plenty of room. This thing only holds like eight pounds of gas. We'll monitor it. If we have to, we'll put a water hose on it and cool the tank off, but I think it's cool enough outside right now. It's not quite hot yet. But next thing, I've got my high flow Schrader core depressors. Now these are not core removers. These are made from Appian. You basically squeeze them in, they, they depress the, um, the, what do you want to call them, Cormax fittings, the high flow Schraders, right? Because you can't remove those and work on the system, you know, properly. Um, I also removed the ends of my hoses because I don't have Schrader depressors right here. Notice there's a Schrader depressor, that's a restriction, makes it go a little bit slower. Because I got a full tank here that already has refrigerant, that's why I'm doing that. Normally I don't really worry about that too much. Next we got a purge. So we're gonna open this guy up, this guy up, and then now I always leave that one loose. And we just purged all the way through the system, through here. So we're going to uh, just go ahead and turn on the recovery machine and start recovering. So at this point, we're ready to go. We're open here, we're open here. What's leaking? Something's leaking. There we go. All right. And then go ahead and uh, start on that guy. And we're recovering. Just keep an eye on it, making sure that we're not going over the max charge because we don't want to create a bomb in the back of our vehicles when the temperature outside gets to 110 degrees and that tank temperature gets to above 130 degrees, then you could potentially have a catastrophic rupture. So. Um, we don't want that to happen. So, well actually, I guess it probably would take a little bit more than 130 degrees, but you've got your rupture valve right here. So, all right, so we're gonna let this recover. It'll take a little bit. We're gonna start sanding everything up and just kind of getting ready. Oh, that's why, okay, never mind. I was tripping out because 
it said low pressure for compressor three and I was like, but I disconnected the high pressure control, but the system pressure is just low. <laughs> That's why, okay. I was thinking they had a problem there. We are at the point where it's time to start brazing. Now what I'm gonna do is we're gonna shut the unit down and do the dryer first. So that way we can put the cover back on and start the unit back up. We can braze this compressor all day long with power on, but I've got condenser fan motor running over here, right? So we don't want that. So we're gonna go ahead and take this unit out of test mode. And it's actually calling for three stages of cooling right now. So um, we're gonna go ahead and turn it off. And then uh, notice that when we shut it off, you don't hear these other compressors bypassing. See this one, when you shut it off, it starts making those weird squealing sounds and screeching sounds. It's an LG thing. It's just, in my opinion, gone off an internal bypass way too many times and it damaged the pressure relief inside. I don't know what LG calls theirs, but anyways, they can lose efficiency that way too because under high pressure situations, it starts to slightly bypass and then you lose compression ratio and just lots of issues. But anyways, um, so we're gonna get this cover pulled off and try to get this dryer swapped out. I've got uh, nitrogen ready to go and actually already sweeping through the system. All right, so uh, they came to their senses and decided to start using Sporlin catch-alls for their uh, OEM dryers now. So that is awesome. Um, got some uh, Viper heat blocking compound on there to protect the dryer, even though this has the extended connection, so that's cool. Uh, made sure that I traced out the proper lines to make sure we got the third stage all the way back. I went ahead and cut it out because we got a lot of room in here. So I'm gonna fit this guy, get it clamped, and we're gonna get it brazed in. Okay, we got the nitrogen flowing, dryer's going in the right direction, we're good to go here. All done brazing that we're gonna cool it off we still got nitrogen flowing through again because I have someone else with me had him putting that panel on while I was doing this and then he's gonna put the crankcase heater on and I'm gonna get the evacuation stuff ready to go currently doing a pressure test with nitrogen right now so far looking good uh, the s man 480v manifold has the tightness test built into it where it does a timer you can also do temperature compensation if you put the suction temperature clamp on somewhere it'll compensate based off of the temperature change of the suction line, but I'm not too worried about that right now. Um, so we're running the pressure test. We're also testing the crankcase heater before I hook it back up, make sure we have resistance across it because I didn't know if it was working properly or not. Um, we'll also do a current test once we get it hooked back up, but the fact that we see resistance is a good sign. So we're gonna put that back in 
and then we're actually going to start this guy back up and uh, we'll pull the evacuation and stuff with the unit running. Um, next, actually, too, I'm going to open up this compressor contactor, have a look inside there. I mean, I, I see a little bit of dark colored something in there, but honestly, it doesn't look bad. I don't see a reason to change that contactor. Nothing looks bad about that. So we're going to put the cover back on, we'll leave it be, and uh, we'll get the evacuation started. All right, I'm impatient, but I don't, it, it dropped 0.2 in five minutes. I'm not worried about that. I'm confident that we're good to go. So we're gonna go ahead and vent this. This is just nitrogen. And then we'll get the evacuation running. Make sure this guy's turned, oh, that guy's unhooked already. So, got the vacuum pump all ready, get the micron gauge and everything out. We've got the unit turned back on and it's cooling. So now they have a call for Y1 and Y2, but even though we got third stage disconnected, we've got the micron gauge on there. We're pulling an evacuation, got the blue vac opened up. We're watching that happen. We're gonna let this run for a bit clean up some of our messes and probably take a lunch. So we're doing good. It's looking good so far. This is our evacuation target on the green, 500 microns. And this is the maximum decay target of a thousand microns. So we're slowly getting there, which is expected. I just closed the gas ballast a few minutes ago. But what I suggest you do on these things is always agitate the compressor because the nitrogen pressure test could have, uh, saturated the oil with nitrogen and the nitrogen that was in the system before so always do that and you're going to see a spike when you do that and that's normal but then after the spike you typically see a dramatic drop so it takes a second you see it's still climbing but then you'll usually see it just kind of boom pull back down and i'll have to do that a couple times just to kind of agitate the oil getting all the non-condensables out of it nitrogen out of it because that's pretty much all that's going to be in there because this is a dry system so There's that drop now. Notice you're seeing the drop come down. And that's pretty typical. So I like to do that a couple times, agitate it. We also have the crankcase heater running on it too. So Now this is a warranty compressor, so I gotta return it. Now I don't think they're gonna want it back, but you always assume they're going to, right? So if you didn't already know, as long as you don't have gobs of solder, you can actually get these plugs back in if you use a Phillips head screwdriver. And when it pushes in the middle, it compresses it and then it's back in. So I got them both back in um, and you know that should be more than enough. That way they can do whatever they wanna do if they do ask for it back. All right, just got back from lunch. Measure Quick is telling me to isolate the system so it can go into decay. So we're gonna close this, close this. We are now in decay mode and it is gonna give me a pass fail on decay here in just a minute. Um, now you see, if I zoom out, it seems like it drops straight down. That's because I went to lunch. Like it passed the decay test. So it uses the algorithm to tell you. Yeah. It uses the algorithm to tell you that it actually passed. So that's cool, perfect. So we know where evacuation's good. It's currently at 439 microns and rising, but it basically just looks at the, the rate of rise and it calculates that after so much time, it won't be above a thousand microns. I like that about the digital stuff because you don't have to sit here and wait. Um, so, all right, we're gonna get this thing shut off and get ready to go ahead and charge this guy up. All right, I have got it charged up and everything is running. All three compressors are now running. They've been running for about 10 minutes. I'm all probed up with all my probes. So let's scroll on through here. So first stage, did I just lose? Okay, yeah, first stage, sub is about 15 degrees, but remember we're using discharge pressure so that can kind of skew the numbers a little bit. I don't see anything crazy here, superheat, you know, where I'd expect it to be. Second stage, superheat's a little bit high, subcooling is a little bit low. We might need to look into that a little bit. It might be a little undercharged for the second stage. But let's go to our third stage because that's the one we changed the compressor on. Superheat's 14 degrees. That's, I mean, not too bad. Expansion valve's still kind of ranging. Subcooling's about 17 degrees. Nothing too crazy. Let's scroll on over. It's about 86 degrees ambient right now. Discharge line temp is relatively decent at 163 degrees. 
Uh, temperature splits right on the money, 19 degrees. And we're calling for 19.2. Remember, temperature split across the return and supply is not always 20 degrees. Dependent on your outdoor conditions, uh, well, your relative humidity, your indoor conditions, yeah, that number is going to change, okay? As the humidity goes up and down, the required temp split is going to change. Um, airflow seems pretty decent at 6,300 CFMs. Uh, Calling for about 6,000 CFMs. Delivered capacity is about 160,000 BTUs, and we're calling for about 162,000 BTUs. I mean, this guy's on the money. I'm gonna look into that second stage a little bit more, but I'm a happy camper. This guy is doing everything it can. I'm still gonna rinse off the condenser here in a few minutes because the front was a little bit dirty and we do have a water hose up here. So we're gonna do that in a few minutes, but let's go back and look at that second stage again and see what that one's looking like as far as our numbers go. Subcooling's a little bit on the low side. They don't really go off of subcooling on these guys, but if you basically look at what the first and second stage or first and third stage are doing this sub is a little bit low indicating to me we might be a little bit undercharged possibly all right we are back up and running everything's put together we're just going to rinse off the condenser real quick which it's not really dirty enough i think to affect too much on the operation um, but this unit's back up and running they should be happy this compressor was covered under warranty um, through the manufacturer I think that it was damaged because they weren't cleaning the condenser. And the third stage, which is typically, oh no, the third stage is the bottom. So the bottom half of both sides. So actually the second stage is the one that usually has the most problems because it's the hardest to clean up at the top. But that's pretty much it. Everything else on this unit's working. All the condenser fan motors are working. Um, all is well. So we're gonna put this door back on, give this side a quick rinse, and that's it gonna give the customer the keys we got the new disconnect on everything is good for whatever reason I lost the first part like the first footage for this video so we originally went out there and uh, ha actually had another technician out there the technician was out there he diagnosed the unit and uh, he was out there cleaning it and he noticed that the third stage compressor actually and the the first stage compressor were both making a really funny noise um, when they were running but he went ahead and cleaned up the unit and the first stage quieted down, but the third stage was still making the noise. So the where my footage actually started, uh, that for whatever reason I lost, was me going out to double check the diagnoses of a failed compressor because it was under warranty. We wanted to make sure it was 100%. And I went out there and the compressor ran. It runs fine. But what I noticed is that whenever the head pressure would get kind of high, the compressor would start to bypass internally, like a pressure relief was letting go, but it wasn't even that high. And you could hear like an audible high-pitched squealing sound, like gas was bypassing in the top of the compressor, but it wasn't even that hot. So we condemned the third stage compressor because of that. Now it was still running, it just wasn't operating and pumping efficiently. The compression ratio was all messed up. And that's the footage that I lost. But you start, saw when I came back. Now, the other thing I noticed was that the unit also had a bad disconnect switch because when I was double checking the diagnoses, I started check, checking voltages and I noticed that like one of the compressors had really weird voltage and then I traced it back to a failed disconnect switch. So I was able to get it running in the meantime. And then I came back out and we changed the bad disconnect switch and the third stage compressor. So that's where the video took off basically. And you saw that part. Um, you know, when I'm going through these, I know it may seem repetitive, you know, recover the gas, change the compressor, purge with nitrogen, you know, all that stuff, change the dryer, all that stuff. But I mean, it's, I think it's important for people to realize that it almost needs to become a routine when you're doing that stuff. You know, it sucks having to bring my entire van on the roof, but it just, it is what it is. That's how these jobs work, right? So you just go through, obviously, brazing with nitrogen as much as possible. Now, I'm not going to pretend like I'm this perfect service technician that does that every single time. I don't, okay? I try my best, but there's times that I don't braze with nitrogen, but there's also times that it's almost impossible to braze with nitrogen. Are you working on a capillary tube system? Trust me, try brazing with nitrogen on a cap tube system. It's just a pain in the butt. Because of the pressure differential created by the cap tube, you can't really flow the nitrogen low enough to not create a pressure drop across that cap tube. It just becomes a problem pump down refrigeration systems can be kind of tricky to braze while having nitrogen flowing through the system. So it's not always practical that you're going to flow with nitrogen, but on a compressor change like this, sure, I'm going to. Now, as far as this compressor, 
I think that the compressor was internally damaged simply because the customer doesn't do routine maintenance. They constantly run really, really high head pressure. It damages the internals of the compressor, messes up the oil in the compressor, and causes issues. Now, this one also had an electrical issue because that disconnect switch was starting to fail uh, from a loose connection, of which I temporarily tightened, but I still didn't trust the internals of that disconnect switch. Surprisingly enough, the disconnect switch is what took the longest to get, but I didn't want to come back out and do this job until I had it. So that's why it was a three-week time from when we, I mentioned in the video that we were out here cleaning the condenser three weeks ago. It took me three weeks to get that disconnect switch because it was on back order for whatever reason. But once we got it, we went back out. But again, you know, it's just about trying my best, right? I am absolutely not perfect, but I'm going to try my best to go through there and make sure that this system is operating as best as possible. Um, flowing with nitrogen, protecting our dryer and components with the heat blocking compounds or wet towels, that kind of stuff, right? Again, just try your best. So we went ahead, we got it back up and running, and it honestly, I think this was done back in August and we're now in November. So everything's been working fine other than I'm pretty sure we had to go out and clean this unit again since then. But, you know, it is what it is. So I really, really appreciate you making it to the end of the video. Thank you so very much for all the support. Uh, let me know with some feedback down in the comments what you think. And uh, if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to my website, hvacrvideos.com. Uh, you can help to support the channel if you're interested in doing so by going to truetechtools.com. Use my offer code BIGPICTURE, one word. Uh, when you use that, you get an 8% discount on majority of the items on their website. Then I get a small commission from that. There's a few things the discount code doesn't apply to, but it's a great way to help support the channel. Of course, go into my website, hvacrvideos.com. Merchandise available on there. You can support the channel via that way. Also via Patreon, PayPal, YouTube channel memberships. But really, the easiest way to support this channel is literally just watch the videos from beginning to end. Okay. Again, thank you so very much. I really do appreciate you. And uh, we will catch you on the next one.